Hello everyone. Today we'll be solving Cambridge International AS and A level biology paper two AS level structured question, May June 2021, paper two two. One A. Figure 1.1 is a photomicrograph of a region of a eukaryotic tissue. Some of the cells are in stages of mitosis. So we can see metaphase over here. We can see anime, anaphase at F. Identify which stages of mitosis are shown in cell E and cell F in figure 1.1. So we can see E is at metaphase. And we can see F is at anaphase. Part two, microtubules are present within the cells that are in stages of mitosis, but these are not visible in figure 1.1. State the function of microtubules in mitosis. Microtubules assemble to form spindle fibers. Microtubules attach to centromere and allows to pull the sister chromatids to opposite poles. Part three, state with the reason whether figure 1.1 shows a region of animal or a plant tissue. So in figure 1.1, we can see a plant tissue because we can see cell wall and it is regular shape. Part B, semi-conservative replication of DNA occurs during interphase before mitosis begins. Write the correct term in the spaces provided to complete each statements A to D. The DNA double helix unwinds and is separated into two template strand when Hydrogen bonds holding the two strands together are broken. So the word will be hydrogen. One of the template strand of DNA is copied in fragments. The enzyme, DNA polymerase, the enzyme dash is required to join the fragments together to form a continuous strand of DNA. So the enzyme DNA ligase is needed. DNA ligase job is to jo join DNA together by forming the phosphodiester bond. Complementary DNA nucleotides are added to the template strand catalyzed by the enzyme. So catalyzed by the enzyme DNA polymerase. Now it's gonna be DNA polymerase. Dash are regions of new repeating nucleotides. Okay, telomere. Telomere are regions of repeating nucleotides. Question number two. Sugars are transported within phloem sieve tubes from a source such as mature leaf to a young leaf, which acts as sink. The young leaf also needs water and dissolves mineral ions which arrive at the leaf within xylem vessel. As the young leaf matures, the quantity of sugar taken up by the leaf decreases to zero, but the need for the water increases. Suggest and explain why the quantity of sugar taken up by the developing leaf decreases to zero over time, but the need for water increases. Okay. So the leaf, when it becomes mature, it becomes the source itself for sucrose. Photosynthesis provides enough sugar for its own respiration and also extra sugar that is produced can be transferred to other parts of the plants. The leaf cells need more water to maintain turgidity and prevent wilting. More water is also needed for photosynthesis and cell elongation and enlarging the vacuoles. Part B, the features listed in table 2.1 are present in one or more of the three cell types, companion cell, phloem sieve tube element, xylem vessel element. Complete the table 2.1, use a tick if the feature is present, 
across if the feature is absent. So cytoplasm, all right. In the companion cell, yes. Phloem sieve tube element, definitely yes. Xylem vessel element, unfortunately no, because it is dead. So cell surface membrane in a companion cell, definitely present. Phloem sieve tube element, definitely present. Xylem vessel elements, no, because it's a dead cell. Lignified cell wall. Lignified cell wall will not be present in companion cell, neither in phloem sieve tube element, but will be present in vessel, xylem vessel element. Nucleus. Nucleus will not be present, okay, will be present in companion cell. Phloem sieve tube does not have nucleus to make space for the assimilates to travel. And xylem vessel elements will not have nucleus because it's a dead cell. Question number three. In mammals, some cell signaling molecules are steroid lipid hormones. These hormones are transported in the bloodstream to reach capillary networks. At a capillary network, hormones pass out of the blood into the tissue fluid. Figure 3.1 is a diagram of a capillary network. Blood from artery is coming through here. Okay, we can see the blood is then passing through the capillary. The blood is then passing through the capillary. All right, it is branching off and then it is meeting at a venule and then back to vein. Within this particular time, obviously, the blood is going to lose some plasma, which is going to turn into tissue fluid. Tissue fluid is going to enter region X, which is then going to be turned into a lymph fluid. Now, the question says, describe the differences between blood arriving at the arterial end of the capillary and network, capillary network and the tissue fluid surrounding the body cells. So for obvious reason, blood has red blood cells. So more white blood cells, example, neutrophils and monocytes will be present. More large protein will be present in blood and higher concentration of oxygen will be present in blood. Blood will also have higher concentration of glucose and amino acid and lower concentration of carbon dioxide in the capillary, in the arterial end of the capillary network. Not all the tissue fluid passes back into the blood capillaries to enter the bloodstream. Some of the tissue fluid drains into blind-ended vessels such as shown in X, figure 3.1. Name the fluid that formed in vessel X. So vessel X actually shows lymphatic system, so it will be lymph. Hormone S is a steroid hormone involved in cell signaling. Figure 3.2 shows the sequence of events that occur when hormone S enters target cell. So hormone S, as you can see, it enters the target cell directly inside and then it binds to a receptor and then it goes and causes transcription and then translation and a protein is produced. Explain why hormone S shown in figure 3.2 does not need to pass through a transport protein to enter the cytoplasm of a target cell. So in this case, we can understand that the hormone S can cross the hydrophobic core of the phospholipid bilayer. The hormone S is hydrophobic and it is very small in size, which is why it can just directly pass through the uh, cell membrane. Part C, the target cell can respond to other cell signaling molecules in addition to hormone S. The cell has receptors in the cell surface membrane, in the cytoplasm, and in the nucleus. Explain why hormone S binds only with receptor R in the cytoplasm and not with other receptors shown in figure 3.2. So hormone S has a complementary shape for binding to R only, which is why it will only bind to uh, R. Part D, the hormone receptor complex shown in figure 3.2 enters the nucleus and binds to DNA. This switches on a gene coding for a polypeptide that is synthesized in the cytoplasm. Name the structure through which hormone receptor complex enters the nucleus. 
Well, if it wants to enter the nucleus, it must enter through nuclear pore, as we can see over here. So nuclear pore. Name the process occurring at B and C. So let's see at process. Okay, we can see B is transcription and C is translation that is going on. Name the structure G. So the structure G is basically ATS ribosome. Eukaryotic ribosomes are ATS. E, cell signaling by hormone S results in production of a functioning globular protein. Molecules composed of three identical polypeptide chain. After the synthesis of this polypeptide, changes need to occur to form functioning globular protein molecule. Outline the changes that need to occur to form a functioning globular protein molecule. So the polypeptide, after it forms the primary structure, it needs to form the secondary structure, which consists of alpha helix and beta pleated sheets. The alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet are basically the secondary structure. Then a further folding allows to form tertiary level structure but it includes hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, disulfide bonds, hydrophobic interactions, which holds the tertiary structure together. The quaternary structure is formed when two or more polypeptide forms a protein. So as you can see, this particular protein is made from three polypeptide chains. All right, so globular protein has a hydrophilic amino acid outside, and that makes it water soluble. And some globular protein has prosthetic group to carry out a specific function as well. Example, hemoglobin contains hem. Question number four. A person who is exposed to tobacco smoke is at a greater risk of lung cancer and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Many people with COPD have both chronic bronchitis and emphysema. These diseases cause changes in the gas exchange system. For example, changes occur in the total lung surface area to volume ratio. Tar in tobacco smoke has a number of effects in the cells lining the gas exchange system. State the main effect of tar on the cells lining the gas exchange system that are related to lung cancer and to chronic bronchitis. So the first with lung cancer. You see, tar is a carcinogen. It acts as a mutagen. Example, it causes changes to the sequence of nucleotides in DNA. These can in turn switch of tumor suppressor gene and can cause lung cancer. Chronic bronchitis. So tar paralyzes or destroys the cilia. As a result, the cilia cannot waft away the mucus which results in chronic bronchitis. B, part B, a student investigated the effect of surface area to volume ratio on diffusion. Agar was prepared with universal indicator solution and sodium hydroxide solution. The agar was colored blue. Three cubes A, B, C were cut from a solid block of blue agar. Each cube was a different size. Universal indicator solution changes to a red color in the presence of acid. The student prepared table 4.1 to show the sizes and surface area to volume ratio of each cube. So cube, we can see cube A, B, and C. Length of each side, one. Total surface area, six. Volume slash CM cube. And surface area to volume ratio, six is to one. All right, we can see for the part C, it is missing. Length of each side, 3 cm, total surface area. Total surface area will be 3 into 3 and then multiplied by 6. So 54 cm squared. All right, and the volume will be 3 into 3 into 3, 27 cm cubed. 
So as a result, we can see that there is only a two is to one surface area to volume ratio. All right, the question says complete table 4.1. All right, we did it. Now part C, cube A, B, C were placed in small beaker. At time zero second, dilute hydrochloric acid was added to the beaker to cover the cubes. Okay, the student timed how long it took for each cube to change color completely. Complete figure 4.1 to show the results that are obtained. So for obvious reason, all right, we can see cube A, which has the highest surface area to volume ratio. All right, it will take the shortest amount of time. So A, all right, and then B and then C. You see, it will take the longest amount of time to change color completely. Part D, some people with emphysema may be offered lung volume reduction surgery, LVRS, in which diseased lung tissue is surgically removed. One expected outcome of the surgery is an improvement in the total lung surface area to volume ratio. Total lung surface area to volume ratio is improved, okay? So just why there is an improvement in total lung surface area to volume ratio after surgery has been carried out? Okay, so... Typically, in people with emphysema, the alveoli burst to produce one larger air sac. A removed tissue has higher proportion of larger air sac. So the remaining tissue has healthy functional alveoli, healthy functional alveoli which can stretch better, all right, and ventilate better, and thereby, you know, uh, gas exchange can take place efficiently. Part E, in human's blood that becomes oxygenated in the lungs reaches body tissues without coming into contact with blood that is deoxygenated. Explain how the blood that becomes oxygenated in the lungs is kept separate from blood that is deoxygenated. Okay, so we know that only oxygenated blood passes through the left side of the heart. The septum in the heart separates oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Oxygenated blood is in pulmonary vein and deoxygenated blood is pumped through pulmonary and deoxygenated blood is in pulmonary arteries. So they are kept separate in that way. Question number five, figure 5.1 is a transmission electron micrograph showing parts of two plant cells. The function of the middle lamella is cell-to-cell -cell adhesion. The middle lamella is composed of polysaccharide known as pectin. Pectin interacts with polysaccharides, cellulose and hemicellulose in the cell walls of the plant cells so that the cell walls are held close together as shown in figure 5.1. We can see the middle lamella, we can see Golgi body, we can see X, region X, Cell structure X in figure 5.1 is a cytoplasmic channel with strands of cytoplasm passing through the cell walls of the two cells. Name cell structure X and state one of this cell structure, one function of the cell structure. Okay, so we can see the new cell wall. All right, we can see gaps in between them. So the name should be plasmodesmata. All right, and the function for this it should allow simplest pathway movement, transport of water, and cell-to-cell -cell communication. Part B, researchers have discovered that pectin is synthesized within the Golgi body. Golgi vesicles containing pectin are moved to cell surface membrane for release, such as why researchers would not have in investigated ribosome as being the responsible location for the synthesis of pectin. So we know that ribosome only, you know, polypeptides are synthesized. All right. Name the mechanism that is used to transport pectin out of cells. So to transport, okay. So basically, you know, it is in the vesicle. So definitely exocytosis. Juices that are extracted commercially from fruits can also uh, can be made less cloudy by the breakdown of the cell wall using the enzyme cellulase, pectinase, and xylenase. Cellulase hydrolyzes cellulose, pectinase hydrolyzes pectin, and xylenase hydrolyzes hemicellulose. 
Figure 5.2 is a graph showing the effect of cellulose concentration on the activity of cellulase, which is used in making fruit juice less cloudy. Okay, cellulose concentration, milligram per cm cube, rate of reaction, milligram um, uh, product, cm cube per minute. Describe and explain the curve shown in figure 5.2. So what we can see from this particular curve is that as the concentration of cellulose is increasing, the rate of reaction is also increasing, but then plateaus at Vmax, maximum velocity. As the cellulose concentration increases, rate of reaction increases. Increasing cellulose concentration increases the number of collision between enzyme and substrate. At low cellulose concentration, many active sites are not in use. At higher cellulose concentration, active site becomes saturated. Part D. Ultrasound is one possible method that can be used to destroy microorganism that contaminates fruit juices. Ultrasound is the term given to sound waves that are out of the range of human hearing. An investigation was carried out into the effect of ultrasound on the activity of cellulase, pectinase, xylanase used in fruit juice manufacture. For each enzyme, the effect of ultrasound was composed, was compared with no ultrasound on the maximum rate of reaction, Michael is maintained constant, catalytic efficiency Vmax slash Km. Table 5.1 summarizes the results, a higher Vmax slash Km indicates a higher catalytic efficiency. So we can see for cellulase with ultrasound, comparison of Vmax higher, comparison Km higher. So higher the Km, all right? Uh, so, you know, higher Km indicates that, you know, substrate, a higher Km indicates that enzymes does not have enough affinity to the substrate. It has low affinity. No ultrasound, Vmax lower, Comparison of KM, KM is lower. So Vmax is to KM ratio. However, we can see that with the ultrasound, the Vmax is to KM ratio actually increases. So actually it is beneficial to use the ultrasound. We can see for pectinase, ultrasound Vmax is the same, but KM lower. And we can see a very high Vmax slash KM value, which is good. Xylanase with ultrasound, we can see a higher Vmax and we can see KM is the same. However, KM, Vmax to KM ratio is, you know, the catalytic efficiency is much higher than without the ultrasound. So the question in one, in terms of changes in the interaction between enzyme and substrate when ultrasound is used, such as explanation for the lower KM for pectinase and the higher Vmax for xylanase as shown in table 5.1. So we can say lower KM for pectinase in ultrasound means ultrasound increases affinity of enzyme for substrate. Ultrasound makes the active site more accessible for substrate. For xylanase, ultrasound increases the rate of collision between enzyme active site and substrate. This increases the rate of catalysis after binding. Explain whether the data shown in table 5.1 supports the recommendation that ultrasound can be used in the manufacture of fruit juices. So we can see in every cases when we used ultrasound, we see a higher Vmax to Km ratio. That means the catalytic efficiency is increased. So yes, ultrasound increases catalytic efficiency. Question six, the disease myasthenia gravis, MG, and HIV slash AIDS both involve disorders of the immune system. The cause of myasthenia gravis involves the response of B lymphocytes. Explain why MG is also called a disorder for the immune system. You see, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease is a disease in which there is a failure to distinguish between self and non-self proteins. So at neuromuscular junction, immune response occur against the receptor of the cell surface membrane of muscle cells. That's why it is considered as a disorder of the immune system.
Part B, studies have indicated T lymphocytes are involved in stimulating the B lymphocyte response that causes myasthenia gravis. Research has carried out on a research has been carried out on a vaccine that will provide a person with active immunity against these T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. So just and explain how this vaccine will provide a person with active immunity against the T lymphocyte and B lymphocyte responsible for causing myasthenia gravis. We can see vaccine contains antigen, which stimulates an immune response. Antibodies are produced against defective lymphocytes, T and the B cells. So the memory cells remain in the body giving long lasting effect uh, of killing those uh, you know, uh, defective T and B cells. Part C, many people who are living with HIV infected living with HIV infected with HIV develop tuberculosis. If a person does not have any symptoms of TB, one preventative measure is to prescribe antibiotics. This reduces the overall number of cases of TB and death from TB. State one disadvantage of prescribing antibiotics as a preventative measure against TB. Antibiotic resistant bacterial strain may develop because of the high usage of antibiotics for preventative measure. Part D, figure 6.1 is a summary of some antibiotics published by UNAIDS Joint United Nations Program on HIV and AIDS about HIV and HIV AIDS for the year 2017. The figure shown in the figures shown in figure 6.1 for 2017 are estimated. Globally, 36.9 million people are living with HIV. 35.1 million adults and 1.8 million children under 15 years. 1.8 million people be become infected, became infected with HIV. All right. 21.7 million are provided with ART and retroviral therapy. 940. 940,000 people died from HIV AIDS. 47% of the people provide dead with ART while still living with HIV do not have detectable levels of virus in their blood. Okay. One other statistic published by UNAIDS <clears throat> indicated that in 2017, only 75% of the estimated 36.9 million living with HIV knew that they have been infected with the virus. With reference to information in figure 6.1, describe the, discuss the importance of these statistics. Okay, so about 9.2 million people, we see that do not know that they are living with HIV. These people have higher viral loads compared to many on ART. As you can see, that people, those who were living on ART, 47% of them do not have even a detectable levels of virus in their blood. So 9.2 million people do not know they are living with HIV. These people have higher viral loads compared to many on ART. These people have greater risk of developing HIV-related diseases. They are also at greater risk of transmitting HIV. HIV-infected people may develop opportunistic infection, so greater risk of spreading infectious diseases. So guys, that's all for the today's question paper. We are done with this particular paper. Uh, please like the channel and comment on which video that you, you want us to post next. Obviously the questions uh, will be related to chemistry and biology. Uh, we prefer that. Uh, thank you, see you in the next class. Bye-bye.